Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felden. Okay, once again, you've had your coffee break, and we'll go into program number two this afternoon. And for those of you out in television, again, we just appreciate so much your letters, your financial help, and most of all, your prayers, because after all, I have a little plaque in the kitchen that says, never underestimate the power of prayer. And uh, that is, that's my, my trademark. If you can't pray about it, then it's not worth doing. So again, we appreciate everything and your letters. And again, we're just going to pick right up where we left off in our last four programs. And so we've left our original scripture reference on the board, and we're going to go back to it for just a moment for those of you here in the studio. Uh, just go back to Joel. Keep your hand up there in uh, Luke is where I'm going to go next. But anyhow, just to get things kicked off, we'll go back to where we started our last half hour, and that was in Joel chapter 2. And you remember we dropped in at verse 28, and uh, then we showed how all of these Old Testament prophecies speak of everything happening one thing right after the other, with no indication of a 2,000-year hiatus or parenthetical period of time, however you want to put it, that we now know as the church age. And it just helps you so much to understand that this is the way prophecy is written, that it's all going to keep coming right down the line. All right, so just for starters, let's go back to Joel chapter 2 again so we'll know where we're coming from. All right, verse 28. And it shall come to pass. It's going to happen. Afterward, after a certain number of events have taken place, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit, which we understand was the day of Pentecost. But see, now the Old Testament goes right on into the tribulation. That's next. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke, and so on and so forth. That's all part of the day of the Lord, or what we have been looking at in that previous half hour, of the things concerning the end time, the tribulation and the second coming and the kingdom. Well, then we went all the way up through the Old Testament, and we're just ready to jump into the new, and we ran out of time. But let's just continue on now and jump all the way up from Joel to Luke. And we're going to stay on that same premise that all the Old Testament prophecies as well as the four Gospels are still looking at everything happening right down the line sequentially going into the kingdom. Not a word about the church age. Not a word about the body of Christ or the rapture. Why? That's going to be left for the Apostle Paul, see? And all people can't see that. And they almost get upset with me. And it takes a lot of patience for me not to get upset back. But nevertheless, this is the way it's laid out, see? All right, you lot with me in Luke chapter 1? Luke chapter 1, and again, just to show how we can always put a time element in between two of these statements of prophecy. Luke chapter 1. Verse 31, and the angel is speaking to Mary. <coughs> and the angel says, well, up in verse 30, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Now, we know that happened, but now look at the next verse. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Has that happened yet? No, still hasn't happened. So put your hyphen between those two verses, see? All right, now I got another one. Thought of it during break time. Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Now, I could go the rest of the afternoon right here. <laughs> but I'll try to keep it short. Acts chapter 15, you'll remember, is Luke's record of the Jerusalem Council. 
51 AD, 22 years after the crucifixion and after Pentecost. And of course, the reason for it is that Paul has now begun his ministry amongst the Gentiles. He's establishing these little congregations of Gentiles on his gospel by faith plus nothing, which I'm going to cover either later this afternoon or our next taping. And the Judaizers in Jerusalem couldn't handle that. And of course, they meant well, but they really thought that Paul had misled these poor Gentiles and that they really didn't have a full-blown salvation because they were not keeping the law and they were not adhering to Judaism. And so what did Peter and the eleven do? They sent men to come in behind Paul, and these men were coming in to Paul's little congregations with that message. You can't be saved by Paul's gospel alone. You have to keep circumcision and keep the law. All right, now, lest you look at me quizzically, just look at what it says in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men who came down from Judea, that's Jerusalem, and they were from the Jerusalem church under the control of the twelve. They came down now to Antioch. That's where this is referring to. Paul and Barnabas have been ministering up there in Antioch in Syria. Okay, so certain men came down from Judea and they taught the brethren, Paul's Gentile converts. And this is what they told them. Except or unless you be circumcised, after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Plain English? Well, you can't get it any plainer than that. You can't be saved by this gospel alone. You've got to practice Judaism. You've got to circumcise. You've got to keep the commandments. Now, this verse doesn't say that, but verse 6 does. So just jump up to verse 6. No, 5, I'm sorry. Up to verse 5 that when Paul gets to Jerusalem and he meets with the twelve and the Jerusalem church, there were other voices, and here they are. There rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees who believed. Well, they believed what? The kingdom gospel that Jesus was the Christ. And so these Pharisees now are members of the Jerusalem church. They're believers. Not of Paul's gospel of grace, but of Christ's gospel of the kingdom. All right, but this is what Paul was up against. These fellows were coming in behind him, telling his Gentile converts that you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. Now read on in verse 5, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to do what? Keep the law of Moses. Now, you know, that just flies in the face of when Paul says in Romans 6, 14, you're not under law, you're under grace. I hear it every once in a while. My girls hear it in the office. What's Les talking about? We're not under law. Am I right, Melissa? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, they, they can't comprehend it. What do you mean we're not under the law? I need the Ten Commandments. No, we're not under law. We're under grace. All right, so they come together to discuss this thing with the twelve. Paul and Barnabas against the twelve up there at Jerusalem. All right, so after they finally agree that Paul is right, they've been wrong. Now, it takes good men to do that. We're getting a few. They call and say, Les, I'm finally seeing it. You're right, I've been wrong for 20 years. Now, that takes a good man, and I admire him for it. And, uh, in fact, I just had a call before we left. The pastor down in Florida wants us to come into his church. And that's the first thing I asked him. You mean you agree with me? He says, 100%. And uh, he said, my people will agree with you, 100%. But he said, it took me 10 years. And that's about what it does. You know, it takes a long time to come out of that that's been 20 years wrong and suddenly see that this is where it's at. So when you all, same way here at Jerusalem, the Twelve and the Jerusalem church finally come to the knowledge that Paul was right and they're not going to bug him anymore about putting his people under the law. All right, so now then drop all the way down to verse 13. See, that's just introduction. The program's half gone. Here we get down to verse seven, uh, 13. 
after they had held their peace. What's that mean? Hey, they've been arguing all day. They've been just totally toenail to toenail. Paul, you've got to teach these people circumcision in the law. And Paul says, I will not. And on and on they went. All right, so finally, verse 13, after they had held their peace, James, who was moderating this, the James of Peter, James, and John, he answered, say, men and brethren, hearken, listen to me. Simeon, Peter, has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles, a reference to the house of Cornelius, which was really Paul's salvation. Had Peter not had that experience at Cornelius, he would have never given in at this Jerusalem council. But he finally woke up and said, hey, long time ago, 12 years ago, God showed me that he's going to save Gentiles. All right, here's the result, see? How at the first, he did visit the Gentiles, now watch the language carefully, to take out of them. Now what does that imply? They're not going to be all that many, but he's going to bring a certain small remnant of Gentiles out of their paganism and their unbelief into a salvation experience. All right? So he did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Now James, by Holy Spirit inspiration, remembers something. There's a verse back in the Old Testament that alludes to this without telling us what it was talking about. Next verse. And to this agree the words of the prophets. Old Testament. As it is written, what's the next word? After. Now what does after imply? A period of time. After a given period of time, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is a reference primarily to what? The temple and Jerusalem and the nation of Israel in general. I will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. Well, does that need an explanation? The temple has been off the scene since 70 A.D., Israel has been dispersed. They've just recently, in biblical time, come back to their homeland, reestablished their nation, but they still don't have the temple, but they will. All right, so here's the whole thing again, that after a period of time, a break in the prophetic timeline, God's going to come back and still finish everything that was promised. All right, now go back with me to the book of Amos, and you'll see what James is referring to. Back to Amos. Amos chapter 9. Dropping in at verse 11. Now, you see, without our understanding of the church age, these Jews had no idea what Amos was talking about. And Jesus didn't reveal it to them in his earthly ministry. He left them in the dark. But yet we know now that after God turned to the Gentile world and let Israel lose the temple, lost their homeland, went into the dispersion, yet after that next period of time, which we call the Age of Grace, God's going to come back and finish the prophecies. They're still all going to be fulfilled. All right, here it is. Act, uh, Amos chapter 9, verse 11. In that day, future, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. Well, you see, Amos didn't know that the Romans were going to destroy Jerusalem and the temple again. That was beyond him. But yet, by Holy Spirit inspiration, he could write prophetically that it's going to fall. He didn't know how or what and when, but it's going to fall. But after a period of time, see, after a period of time, then he says, I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. All again to show us 
that prophecy only went up until the time of the appearance, especially of the Apostle Paul, and the opening up of the age of grace. When this age of grace is over, the church has to be taken out of the way so that God can finish his prophecy, his timeline. It's so simple. I mean, it's just so simple. All right, now come back to the book of Romans for a moment, and, and we see much the same kind of language in a little different way, but it's still speaking of the same concept that there's going to be a long period of time when Israel will not be in a place of fulfilling prophecy, but they will be. Their day is coming, and we're getting closer and closer every day. All right, Romans chapter 11. Drop down to verse 25. Romans 11, verse 25. All got it? Romans 11, verse 25. And the Apostle Paul writes, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant or unaware of this mystery or this thing that has been kept secret. That's why the Old Testament couldn't reveal it. <clears throat> Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. And here's what we're supposed to know. That blindness, a spiritual blindness, in part for a period of time, not forever, but for a period of time, spiritual blindness has happened to Israel. What's the next word? Until. See, there's the time element. Israel is going to be kept spiritually blind until a point in time. At what point in time? The rapture of the church when we're out of here. And God picks up where he left off with Israel in the prophetic program. Now I can come back to my timeline again, see? Here we've come all the way up through the Old Testament, Christ's earthly ministry. He ascended, and then shortly later, he raises up the Apostle Paul, sends him into the Gentile world, opens up the timeline now for 1,900 and some years, and then we have to get the church out of the way because now God is ready once again to start dealing with his covenant people. Oh, it's going to be under judgment for seven years, but the final result is what? the return of Christ and the setting up of his kingdom. And until people can understand this break in the timeline, most of them have blenderized the whole shebang, haven't they? And you all know they have. They throw it all into a blender, mix it all up, and then they parcel it out and try to get people to swallow it. Well, all you have to do is just sort it out. And it's so simple. But it just seems as though people don't want to. And uh, that's what I usually tell them. As if you can't see it, it's because you don't want to. Because if you want to see it, the Lord will open up. You know, I've had call after call after call. Les, you know how I found your program? I dropped on my knees one night and I said, God, I want to know what this book is talking about. And within a week, I find your program. Well, that's what we like to hear. It's not less Feldic. It's the Lord working in the hearts of people. All right, now then. I don't think I have to go all the way back to Joel, but come back with me to the book of Acts. Chapter 2. The day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost which we've already referred to a time or two in these prophetic statements in the Old Testament. Your young men shall dream dreams, and your young women shall see visions, and all these things. All right, so now in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit comes down, and evidenced by the little tongues of fire sitting on the heads of the 120, and Peter and the 11 are now preaching to this vast crowd of Jews from every nation under heaven, from all these different languages, and what's the miracle? All right, we got to pick it up down in verse 7. Here's the miracle. And oh, it just blows the minds of these Jews in spite of the fact 
that they've just experienced three years of his miracles. Over and over and over he's been performing miracles. And this is only 50 days later. And yet it just blows their mind. All right, look what it says, verse 7. And they were all amazed. This whole multitude of Jews gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. And they marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these who speak Galileans? Well, what's implied? There are no high-class, educated, language-speaking people up in Galilee. That's the dumb, educated part of Israel. But that's what these guys are. And here they're speaking in all these languages. And then verse 6 says, We hear everyone in our own language. Miraculous. And the multitude was just all shook up. So now then, verse 12, here's the response from this multitude of Jews. They were all amazed, and they were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? What's going on? Now again, i got to remind you, this is only 50, 52, three days after Christ's earthly ministry. What's the matter with these people? Why can't they put two and two together that this is just an extension of what Jesus had been doing for three years that they couldn't get it? What does all this mean? All right, now in verse 13, some went so far as to make the crazy suspicion that, hey, they're drunk. Well, I've never seen a drunk gain in his intelligence. Wasn't that ridiculous? But that's what they thought. You know, they're, they're drunk. They're full of new wine. Now then, Verse 14, And Peter, standing up with the eleven, eleven, lifted up his voice, and he said unto them, You men of Judea, and you that dwell at Jerusalem. Who is he addressing? Jews. Israel. Be this known unto you, and hearken, or listen to my words. Verse 15, For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Now then, verse 16. But this is that, referring to something in the past. And what's to that? What Joel was writing about. Peter says, what you're seeing is what Joel was prophesying. The end is coming. It won't be long until Christ will return and we're going to have the kingdom. Now, if you remember when we went through the little Jewish epistles, James and Peter and John and Jude and Revelation, what was the concept? That just over the horizon, the king is coming. They had no idea of a 2,000-year interval. All right, so Peter again, with all of the expectation that now they're coming close to the end. He said, this is what was spoken by Joel the prophet. Now look what Peter does. He quotes it. Verse 17. And we'll just read it again. It won't hurt us. He's quoting directly from Joel chapter 2, where we started out in the last program. That it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. On my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out no days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now, you see, if Peter would have had any idea that the church age was coming, that's where he would have stopped. But he doesn't. He goes right on. Now, don't miss that. That's one of the key points here in Scripture. Peter does not know that these are not the final days. So he goes right on. And he says, from the prophecy now, from Joel, I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. So what's Peter, Peter telling them? Hey, this is just telling us that the end is coming. 
we're going to be getting ready for those final seven years because if we can survive them, we're going to be in the kingdom. All right, now then, the next verse throws a curve at a lot of people because, again, they don't understand the un Old Testament program. Now, verse 21. And Peter says, quoting from Joel, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, that's not a parallel with Romans chapter 10, 13, a whole different set of circumstances. Here we're speaking about people who would be in the kingdom and they would find salvation by a Jew bringing them to a knowledge of their Jehovah. Now, I've only got two minutes, so you now you've got to move quickly with me. Come back to Isaiah. <clears throat> because from the Old Testament prophets, Israel were going to be the ones to bring salvation or the message of salvation to the unsaved who at this point in time are still pictured as in the kingdom. And they would come to a knowledge of Jehovah through every Jew who was to have been a priest, according to Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. All right. Here is Isaiah's take on it. Chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant who I uphold, my elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He, speaking of the Messiah, he shall bring forth judgment or righteous rule to the Gentiles. Now you come down to verse 6 and it's speaking to the nation. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I will hold thy hand. I will keep thee. I will give you for a covenant for a light to what people? The Gentiles, see? And then when you jump on up to chapter 59 and 60, it's the same thing, that Israel would be the vehicle to bring the Gentiles to a knowledge of salvation. But by the time we get to the near end of Christ's earthly ministry, we now see that that's not going to be the case. There will be no unbelievers in the kingdom for Israel to minister to because they've lost that opportunity. And that's why Jesus told Nicodemus, what? Except you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So now we understand that, no, there will be no unbelievers in the kingdom. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800 369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les.